Um, tonight, we're going to be having uh, sand shells and jingle barrels uh, with our friend Rod, Ronnie, who's here and ready to go. So I do want to start off by saying that um, Shav has decided that he wanted to call this uh, sand shells and jingle bells, which is actually just one of my Christmas cards. And um, it actually doesn't come up until the end. The name of this show is Yuletide Greetings, showcasing nostalgic Santa Cruz County town views and roadside attractions. So I hope you're not disappointed. There will be sand shells and jingle bells. But um, so um, if you don't know me, my name is Ronnie Trubeck and I live in the Santa Cruz mountains between Silicon Valley and Santa Cruz along the coast. I um, am a longtime realtor and I have a passion for local history. And like many collectors, I'm always looking for ways to share my postcard and ephemera collection with others. One fall, I was mulling over my client Christmas cards and came up with the idea of making a holiday card from a local postcard. So I called my friend, Lori Becker, a Forest Laurel design, a graphic designer, and it turned out to be a highly successful, nearly 20 year collaboration. Laurel also helped me put the finishing touches on this PowerPoint and she will be enormously disappointed when she sees her gorgeous home slide not showing properly. Um, so many collectors love stamps, postmarks, messages, photographer, factoids and backstories. And I could give an entire presentation on any one of the postcards that I've used. But since there's so much rich material and wonderful history, I have decided that that's the journey I'm gonna take you on is um, along the history path. I was very challenged to keep it simple and short. For me, uh, many of the listeners tonight know as much or even more about these postcards and locations. So I hope I can adequately capture the essence of each in the brief time that I have available. These holiday cards were created not just from my co postcards, but also some photos in my collection photos from the UCSC, that's uh, University of California, Santa Cruz digital collections and other ephemera I've collected. Also, I've ordered the presentation geographically and not by the year in order to more efficiently tell the story. So this was my first holiday card, a very simple card with an early 1940s image of Ben Lohman, the town where I live. And it looks surprisingly the same today. And Ben Lomond in the San Lorenzo Valley, the area, did I even go over that on this slide? I'm sorry. Boulder Creek, Brookdale, Ben Lomond, Felton is all the San Lorenzo Valley and Scotts Valley and Santa Cruz are the locations for these cards. So Ben Lomond in the San Lorenzo Valley was heavily forested uh, with coastal redwoods in 1870 when California became a state. And a short 20 years later, it was nearly clear cut. So Ben Lomond was originally called Pacific Mills after the Pacific Manufacturing Company Mill that opened in 1878, and that is Mill Street. Here's a later view of Mill Street. A decade later, Captain of Industry James Pierce, founder of the Bank of Santa Clara and the owner of Pacific Manufacturing Company, laid out the new town with the mill superintendent, Thomas Bell. As lumbering moved on, the mill facilities were torn down or converted into commercial and residential buildings. Railroads added passenger service and train depots were built to accommodate the demand. The Hotel Ben Lomond was built by James Pierce in 1889 and had railroad tracks ending nearly at the front door. On behalf of a subsequent owner, the hotel was torched in 1914 for the insurance money. The clubhouse survived and is now a private residence. In 1895, the assistant superintendent Thomas Bell purchased 300 pristine acres and built the Wilderness Experience Rower Denon Hotel. In 1897, the Rower Denon was sold to the assistant postmaster Benjamin Dickinson, who expanded the hotel with a cluster of new cottages near the bridge and named the new section the Dickinson. When Dickinson died in 1945, Gordon Perry purchased and renamed the hotel, the Town and Country Lodge. 
in the late 1960s, it once again became a major destination, this time for hippies and music lovers, music lovers hosting local and touring rock bands, among them the Grateful Dead, the Doobie Brothers, and Leonard Skinner. So you'll notice that there's an abundance of Ben's, Glen's, Locks, Bray's, Lomans, and Dunes, Scottish names, in and around Ben Lomond. It's believed that the names began in the 1850s by a Scottish old timer, John Burns, when he named Ben Lomond Mountain after a mountain of that name in Scotland. The 1880s saw the naming of the town and the Scottish names follow, followed appearing everywhere. These are some of the names in Ben Lomond area. So in 1950s, the city of Santa Cruz began a long process of building a dam to create a water storage reservoir. A Ben Lomond local lobbied for the name Loch Lomond as, uh, as the dam lay at the foot of Ben Lomond Mountain, just the same as the namesake does in Scotland. A grand Scottish festival was planned and thousands of kilts and bagpipes descended for the 1963 celebration. On July 28th, a bottle of water transported from the Scottish Loch Lomond by the U.S. Navy to the Lockheed Missile Facility at the top of Ben Lomond Mountain was delivered to the Ben Lomond resident where she emptied the bottle into the new reservoir. That's just the inside of the card, the postcard, top and bottom. That top image is uh, about Scotsman Robert Hoden, who wanted to live in a castle. And while traveling in the Santa Cruz Mountains, he fell in love with the site on a beautiful bend in the river. He slowly built the castle, patterned after castles he remembered from his boyhood, and using his stone carver skills from his early years, he etched Scottish scenes, poems of Sir Walter Scott, Robert Burns, and Robert Burns into the glass windows. The castles changed hands about half a dozen times, and each owner has added to its comfort and charm. In the late 1870s, the widow Ivy Lee Weatherly lived there with her 12 cats and opened the castle for tours on weekends and holidays. The Rower Denon and Dickinson hotels had many famous guests over the years, but the legendary event was in 1910 when undefeated heavyweight champion Jim Jeffries was lured out of retirement to fight Jack Johnson for a $101,000 purse and chose the Rower Denon for his training camp. Needing to work off 95 pounds gained in retirement, the 315 pound fighter filled sacks with wet sand and built a dam on the river. After it was finished, he disassembled it and reassembled it in another location among other unique training activities. He sparred with visiting fighters every Sunday, one of whom was retired champion gentleman Jim Corbett. Things were pretty slow around the Rower Denon, so a mock trial for the theft of a goose was arranged to entertain the press gallery. The Big Bet fight was held in Reno. A disputed urban myth has it that Jim Jeffries was fed doped tea and had to be helped into the ring. He went 15 rounds in slow motion until he fell through the ropes and was counted out. This site originally housed a general merchandise store, saloon, and the Central Hotel. The mid 1870s was an era when Felton was a prosperous industrial center with tan oak sawmills and lime kilns, providing lime for concrete to rebuild San Francisco after the 1906 earthquake. Redwood logs came pouring in via a 14 mile V flume from Boulder Creek, then were taken by narrow gauge Felton and Santa Cruz Railroad to the Santa Cruz Wharf for shipping. These, those, these same narrow gauge rails are still in place and are currently used by Roaring Camp Railroad to run their passenger beach train to the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk. With the boom came workers who needed houses. When the Central Hotel burned in 1888, a new 50 room hotel was built that was destined to become a Felton landmark. Later, the Grand Central was renamed the Felton Hotel. And I just love these two images taken from the same location over the years. When the Felton Hotel was finally taken down in 1937, the owner, Nick Bellardi, sold all the big wooden beds and other antique furniture from the many rooms for $10 a room, making space for a more modern strip center, which housed local watering holes and restaurants over the decades. 
In the 1990s, my office, Century 21 Showcase Realtors, occupied the right end of the building. My, uh, my own office was in the little room to the left of the main door that is visible in the front of the car in the top photo. Constructed in 1876, the Kremer Hotel, having miraculously been spared the devastating fires of the late 1800s, is the oldest surviving building in Felton. Its early use was as a hotel with adult entertainment, including gambling, loose women, and liquor that flowed freely until 1888 when it was reestablished as a first-class boarding house. Sold in 1888, the new owners named it the Felton Hotel and offered meals for 25 cents or room and board for a dollar a day. The kitchen was housed in a separate building next door for fire safety. As the lumbering and lime played out, the need for large boarding houses diminished. Eventually, the hotel became an apartment house with shops below. The left photo shows the building with the side porches. The right photo shows the building after the 1950s remodel with the side porches removed and updated to a stucco exterior. Note the variety store next door, the kitchen building for the earlier version hotel. In the 1930s, there was a bee farm. Later, the Melsons operated a hobby shop, then moved next to the building next door, which was the variety shop. And a drugstore, electrical shop, appliance store, beauty salon were layered tenants. I worked in the next door Melsons hobby shop building in the 70s when it was Penham and Tidal until my boss forgot to blow out a candle on the counter when closing up and nearly burned the building down. Since I moved to the area in 1969, there have been four restaurants. The most recent is the Humble Sea Tavern with Sasquatch as the logo since Bigfoot sightings are a local legend. Another great story. I just love this 1969 press photo of the brand new covered bridge being painted at Roaring Camp and Big Trees Natural uh, Narrow Gauge Railroad. This, is, this was a press photo, a nice big large photo, and I just love it. The back of the photo also had this clever article titled The Heedless Horseman that described Gary Doyle blithely going about his work atop Curly, a 2000 pound Belgian steed in preparation for the dedication of America's newest and shortest 26 feet covered bridge. The Roaring Camp name comes from a story about Isaac Graham, who arrived in the local Mexican territory with a party of trappers from Tennessee and Kentucky. With a Mexican citizen member of the group, they acquired a large holding from the Mexican government called Rancho Zayanti and established the first powered sawmill west of the Mississippi. Soon, a grist mill and a distillery were added. This camp was an attractive spot for the many pioneers coming west to seek their fortune. Mexican authorities named Isaac Graham's 1830s Wild West Santa Cruz Mountains settlement Drunkard's Camp or Wild and Roaring Camp. After Isaac's death, death in 1864, a San Francisco attorney, Joseph Welch, thwarted the Rancho purchase by logging interests and ended up owning 300 acres of old growth redwoods and meadows, including the grove of truly massive trees along the river that was to become Big Trees Park, later Henry Cowell State Park that is adjacent to Roaring Camp. By 1875, the area's first railroad, the Santa Cruz and Felton, built in nine months time, began carrying tourists to Welch's Big Trees Resort. This journey was not for the fate of heart as the views of the Santa Cruz and Felton Railroad on its way to Felton and Boulder Creek show. The left side black and white picture shows the Boulder Creek Express coming up the San Lorenzo Canyon. The 1887 top right image shows a first class passenger car with two men standing on the end. Notice the two men with the dog on the ground to the left. I believe that the image at the bottom right shows the train decorated for a local portion of a 10,000 mile promotional trip in 1891, carrying ben President Benjamin Harrison. The top left Felton train depot postcard is, a hand, is hand dated July 1936, which is interesting as all passenger trains between Felton and Boulder Creek were discontinued in 1930 
and the last freight train left Boulder Creek in 1934. So maybe the building was still there. I, I, don't, I don't know. George probably knows that. George knows everything about trains in the San Lorenzo Valley. The Trout Farm holds nostalgic memories for generations of Valley families and tourists alike. I love this, Mary Fishmas, so cute. The original bar and gaming room was built across Zianni Creek on the land of the old trout hatchery. The remaining main pond could be viewed from the deck and dining room and was the oldest commercial trout fishing pond in California. Early tourists from the Bay Area came by train as far back as 1903 to fish for rainbow trout in the ponds. After Bill Fisher and his mother purchased the farm in 1955, they began a small dining room where one could get a steak, trout, or chicken dinner for $1.95 while Ma Fisher managed the trout farms. For decades, this Felton landmark hosted fishing, summertime swimming and sunning, nightly dancing, and thrived as a popular location for family gatherings and celebrations, receptions, civic meetings, and band jams. The trout farm was rebuilt after a devastating 2016 fire and is on the verge of reopening. The newly refurbished pool actually opened for a few short days last month before being shut down again by the county for, are you ready for this? Three and a half inch pool coping when they wanted two and a half inch. So they have to jackhammer out all the coping all the way around this enormous pool and put in new coping. So that's Santa Cruz County Building Department. This holiday card, holiday card was my first educational card with a discussion of the history of the location. This card depicts the main intersection of the County Road, now Highway 9, and Pacific Avenue in Brookdale. The Holland Store, later Brookdale Fountain on the right, at one time also served as the Brookdale Post Office. The Fountain Building on the right is gone now and is an unbuildable vacant lot. Holland's Corner was a one block walk to the Brookdale train station and the location of the original post office near the Brookdale Depot. You can see the post office just behind the people waiting to board the train. The house that was used as the original post office is still there and has a Santa Cruz County honorary blue plaque landmark property designation from the Museum of Art and History. These are later images of the Brookdale store and post office uh, having 1929 and then remodeled in 1935. Judge John Logan, developer of the Loganberry and early Redwood preservationist, worked to protect the community of Clear Creek, formerly a railroad whistle stop named Reed Spur. When the post office opened in 1902, the town was renamed Brookdale. Located diagonally across the street on the side of a lumber mill and workers camp, Logan originated the Hotel Minnehaha, 1903 to 1908, then renamed it the Brookdale Hotel, 1908 to 1915, then renamed it again during the war years to the Brookdale Lodge. In its day, the legendary Brookdale Lodge was the iconic resort in California and hosted the rich and famous. Hollywood stars, Mae West, Marilyn Monroe, Joan Crawford, Rita Hayworth, James Dean, W.C. Fields, Humphrey Bogart, among others. Prominent families, foreign diplomats, and even President Herbert Hoover visited the scenic lodge and enjoyed fishing off the bridge in the dining room. The lodge was also famous for its first rate entertaining, attracting the best big band, big and swing groups in the area. During the 1940s, mobsters and criminals became the predominant visitors. This gave rise to the unconfirmed stories of secret rooms, underground passageways, mermaid escorts, and bodies buried under the floorboards. The only verified underground passageway was one that went under the road and was possibly the hotel's original entrance. It was assumed to be used during this mobster period for gun running, bootlegging, and private access for paramours between before either being filled in or destroyed. Surviving the Roaring Twenties, the Great Depression, swing rock and hippie eras, fire floods, foreclosures, government regulators, drownings, arson, fraud, vandalism, neglect, civil suits, and even ghost tales, the Brookdale Lodge rises from the ashes again. 
The famous lodge has changed hands many times and has just recently been partially restored and reopened and appears to be a great success. We eagerly await the reopening of the historic Brook Room, the Mermaid Room, the bar with the pool underwater window, and the swimming pools. The rustic Brookdale Lodge log cabin loggy, lobby still stands on the corner of Highway 9 and Clear Creek Road, still diagonal to the Brookdale Post Office. The world famous dining room image on the bottom right is the most ubiquitous postcard offered on eBay when you search for Brookdale. Volumes have been written about the monumental achievement of preserving the Big Basin Redwood Forest. Praise and credit has been heaped on Andrew P. Hill, photographer, as the man memorialized in the phrase, quote, he saved the Redwoods, unquote, and the founding of the Semper Virens Club in 1900. In reality, it took an enormous coalition of activists, women, conservationists, politicians, journalists, photographers, religious and civil organizations, and philanthropists near and far to realize the dream of California's first state park. Sadly, a devastating forest fire burned nearly the entire park and nearly all its historic buildings and facilities in the CZU fire of 2020. This is the famed auto tree. This is the auto tree burning. Remarkably, most of the trees that perished in the blaze were not redwoods. The great majority of old growth redwoods, 97%, survived the intense heat and flames. Many of the redwoods that were left blackened have begun sprouting big, bright, feathery, soft shoots at their bases and up and down the trunks where the branches were burned off. This was the campfire bowl. I, uh, I took this picture myself. It's not a postcard, this bottom picture. I snuck into the park. It was closed. And I snuck into the park with a friend and was able to grab a couple photos before um, we got busted and uh, kicked out. They were in the process of cutting down the dead trees and cleaning everything up and really didn't want people sightseeing like me. Redwood Park Inn lobby was later the dining room. This is what was left that uh, I took this picture of the remaining um, fireplace. This is my friend, Bruce Baker. Uh, he took this picture, actually he set this picture up and had somebody else snap it um, for him. He saved this Big Basin Redwood State Park sign. He, he was a contractor with the park anyway to cut down trees and do all that. And he saved the sign um, for it to be restored and maybe replaced someday. Big Basin State Park has reached a milestone in its rebuilding and recovery from the wildfire that shut it down for nearly two years. The summer of 2020, oh, 2022, well, wrong, saw limited park reopening by reservation only while long-term reimagining research planning and workshops continue. After the horrifying fires and devastation from the, devastation from the 2020 CZU fire, an acknowledgement of the local volunteer fire department first responders was in order. Not one fire person left their team and all chose to stay with their department for days on end, battling rampant undergrowth, which spread the flames quickly, protecting structures, downtown areas, landmark buildings, while their own families were trying to evacuate and their own homes were at risk and several lost. My deepest gratitude and heartfelt appreciation went out to the volunteer men and women that continually step in harm's way to protect our community. This is the Ben Lomond Fire Department, top left, the Ziani Department, top right, the Felton Fire Department, bottom right. Uh, if I could go back to this picture for a second, um, the fire chief in both, I mailed this to all the fire departments as well as my client database and everybody else who I send Christmas cards to. And the uh, fire chief in Boulder Creek had his admin contact me and said, where did you get that picture on the bottom right? I've never seen that. And if you're a collector, you know, you've got hundreds, tens of hundreds and possibly thousands of pictures and you don't remember where you got them all. So um, it took me a long time to find it and figure it out. And uh, I finally got it and sent it to him. So he was very happy about that. Another picture of the Ziani Fire Department. And then this half tone behind this picture is um, the old firefighting equipment from around, I don't even know when that is, turn of the century. 
um, where they had the horse drawn um, fire carts. Some of these have my signature on them because I don't have blanks that were, uh, I, I had these printed both ways for business and for personal, and I don't have um, copies of all the ones that I did for personal. So you get to see my business, uh, <laughs> my business signature. These are the black and white images are just old um, firefighting images that I had. And then the acknowledgement of the Ziani Boulder Creek Fire Department, Ben Lomond and the Felton Fire Department uh, firemen. So I thought that those were pretty cool shots. I did not take those. Those were actually from a, a local um, photographer, SLB Steve. Gordon's Chuck House. I know that uh, Debbie might remember this. So this Scotts Valley landmark restaurant was run by Don Gordon in the 50s, 60s, and the early 70s. The black and white steer that used to overlook the Scotts Valley, Scotts Valley from the roof of the Chuck House was replaced with a flashing neon sign captioned, never a bum steer. And that's kind of in the middle of the picture, black and white. Uncle Don converted an old school bus into Gordon's Chuck House Giants fan booster bus. And dozens of local diehard Giants fans gathered at, at the Chuck House on home game days, hoping to be early enough to obtain one of the highly desired seats aboard the booster bus. Rain or shine, win or lose, the lucky fans aboard the bus enjoyed a day at Candlestick Park, followed by a ride back to the restaurant for drinks and dinner. When Highway 17 was widened and the intersection redone in the 70s, the land was expropriated for road widening and the Chuck House and Santa's Village on the other side of Highway 17 was torn down. Back in the days of drive-ins and diners, odd tourist attractions were popular diversions as Americans took to the shiny new highways. Much has changed, but, re but many remember our local roadside attraction, The Lost World. The Lost World beckoned beachgoers with a cheeky, long-necked brontosaurus peeking over the Highway 17 fencing, luring children of all ages. Cave Boy was there to greet you, and T-Rex emerged from the top of the entrance booth. Note the claw marks on the back side of the card where Rex added his signature. The Lost World emerged when Axel Erlinson sold his Scotts Valley property with the tree circus of incredible sculpted trees to Larry and Peggy Thompson. The Thompsons added life-side fiberglass dinosaurs, cave boy, and other fantastic creatures to attract passing traffic. They named the park the Lost World while the tree circus became the trees of mystery. The park operated for 14 years, closing in 1977. At that time, the majority of the trees were transferred to the Bethanti Gardens in Gilroy. These postcards show the Lost World entrance sign on Scotts Valley Drive and two of Alex's trees, the geometric tree and the golden tower. Three original trees can still be seen at the Tree Circus Center on Scotts Valley Drive. Dan, this next one's for you. So, Holy City in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Former necktie salesman, palm reader, charlatan, and bigamist, Father Riker purchased the original 30-acre parcel of land south of Los Gatos for $10 in 1919 and founded the Holy City in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Promoted as a utopian city in the 20s and 30s, Holy City offered everything from gas and food to subdivision lots on the moon and most things in between. Calling his ide ideology the perfect design Christian way, Riker, a misogynist and extreme racist, preached the eclectic philosophy that included temperance, white supremacy, racial segregation, and instructed his followers, estimated to be about 300, to practice celibacy. Isolated by construction of the new Highway 17, fires and neglect, Holy City was eventually reduced to a few derelict buildings. Mistakenly called the leader of a Negro group by the New York Times, William C. Riker was arrested in California, October 1942 on six counts of sedition, but was never convicted. Riker died December 1969 at Agnew State Mental Hospital in California at the age of 96. 
the 172 acres, the Holly City had grown, the 172 acres of lush woodland was purchased in 2016 for $6 million by Robert Dugan, a billionaire biotech magnet and Scientology's biggest donor. I had to be very careful when I was designing these cards to send out. I didn't feel like I could send the top right uh, image, the gentle, Gentile white man is the king of the entire world. Probably not a good thing to send on a Christmas card to clients. Uh, I have many, many, many Holy City cards and they're all pretty um, racist and misogynist and pretty shocking. And here we are, sand shells and jingle bells. <laughs> this is for you, Shav. Shav, Shav. <laughs> so who's never been to the beautiful Coconut Grove? Built in 1907 to replace the destroyed Neptune Casino, Coconut Grove refers to the entire casino building, building as well as the ballroom. By the way, there was no gambling in these casinos. Remodeled, redecorated, and renamed in 1934, the Grand Ballroom featured 250 real palm trees for a South Seas look and feel. A popular spot for dancing to big bands through the 1960s when teen dances with more contemporary artists took over. In 1981, an additional 10 million remodel was completed with the spectacular 6,000 square foot ocean view room featuring a retractable glass ceiling. So this is the beachfront before the beach boardwalk, um, 1889. And you can see that passengers waiting on the wooden boardwalk for the horse-drawn streetcar that runs to the left of the railroad track. And you'll notice that there's horses and carriages on the beach. That was perfectly acceptable and um, done often. The saltwater Neptune baths and the adjacent adjacent larger 200 dressing room Miller Liebrandt bathing pledge can be seen beyond the restaurant. The Neptune Casino built by Fred Swanton, the penultimate entrepreneur, featuring a Moorish design with 19 onion domes opened June 1904. The massive building featured a 35 foot wide arcade facing the ocean, a dining room that could expand to seat 4,000, 2,500 seat theater and a third story observatory that offered views far out to the sea. The Neptune burned two years after opening and Fred offered to burn timbers for the hauling for sale. Swanton moved quickly, starting rebuilding as the summer season was just around the corner. He started a publicity campaign as if the new destination already existed using a rendering of the future casino and using a train to travel through Central California with the banner stating, never a dull moment. By the way, these casino, oh, I already had that, did not have any gambling. A canvas casino and temporary plunge baths opened within two weeks of the fire. The gala grand opening and inaugural ball was held just a scant one year later in June 1907. On this Southern Pacific quote on the road of a thousand wonders, unquote promotional double fold postcard, you can see left to right, the fabulous Sea Beach Hotel burned 1912, the green clamshell bandstand, the rotunda atop the casino, the large natorium building containing a heated indoor saltwater pool called the plunge. The lower image shows the pleasure pier, the aquarium, the building with the green roof is the dance hall and skating rink. The next to it is the Gary, dairy kitchen, the bowling alley, and at the far right, the Thompson Scenic Railway. So if you look at this top picture carefully, you can see the pole with the ropes attached. The rope going to the left is kind of horizontal and goes up past the shore break onto the sand. Since nobody knew how to swim, a wading rope was anchored to a platform offshore, which allowed bathers to safely enjoy the water. A whistle blew at various times during the day and everybody went into the surf to take the waters while holding onto the rope until the whistle blew to come out. Check out the women's heavy sea bathing costumes. If a young lady wanted to be especially daring, she could wear 
racy lace stockings instead of the solid black woolen ones. It's no wonder they couldn't swim with all those <laughs> clothes on. In 1917, a concessionaire offered plane rides from the Pleasure Pier shown in the top right of this top image. The rides were risky and very exciting since the planes had few instruments and no radios or brakes. Or brakes. The Pleasure Pier also covered a big giant intake pipe of the salt water into the uh, natorium for the saltwater plunge. And then the bottom picture shows that the, the beachwear was shifting from street clothes to actual swimwear. So you see a nice mix of um, street clothes and people wearing actual bathing suits. The first Miss Santa Cruz was selected May 1924 and the first Miss California pageant was held June of the same year. In 1924, the Santa Cruz Sentinel advertised for bathing girls who were needed as extras for the moving pictures. During the 30s and 40s, excepting the war years, tourists from San Jose, San Francisco, Oak and Oakland could take the Southern Pacific Suntan Special right to the boardwalk. In 1932 alone, the train delivered as many as 30, 35,000 people each Sunday, where the train was greeted with a blast from the boardwalk brass band. Until 1939, the train arrived via over the hill, that would be over the Highway 17 mountains, passing through Felton and, currently, and the current location of Roaring Camp. When the Southern Pacific closed the mountain division, the train was rerouted via the Watsonville Junction. Many Santa Cruzans learned to swim in the Red Cross Learn to Swim program held in the plunge in the early 1940s. The plunge was removed in 1962 and today holds the Neptune Kingdom Entertainment Center and a miniature golf course. Brad Swanton brought aquatic attractions to guarantee crowds for the Natorium, a spectacle in itself. During its lifetime, over 7 million people frolicked in the heated indoor saltwater pool. 2,500 people could use the lockers and dressing rooms at one time. In 1943, the local Naval Hospital used the healing ocean water in the plunge for patient therapy. The plunge water carnival events with Olympic spit swimmer Duke Kahamamoku <laughs> and surfer king lifeguard trapeze performer and Jansen swimwear model Don Mighty Bosco Patterson were sold out every time. One event that brought fame to the boardwalk was the 12 second slide for life. From the top of the casino roof with 12 year old Harry Murray hanging below, the mighty Bosco hurled down the cable until seconds before it slammed into the Pleasure Pier when they dropped into the water. They continued this act for about five years. The Suntan Junior Boardwalk train, you can see the tracks on the right here, was one of three trains that ran along the boardwalk over the years. The third train, the city of Santa Cruz, ran 1938 till the war years when the tracks were removed to make room for staircases for easier access to the beach. I have to admit that that picture of the, uh, the center top with the girl is not the roller coaster. That's the uh, wild mouse, which was pretty wild too. But yeah. anyway, it looks like it was uh, on the roller coaster. So Thompson Scenic Railway was an early type of roller coaster that cost a small fortune of $35,000 to construct in 1908. The four minute, 25 mile an hour diving and climbing ride on an undulated wood, wooden hills. The Scenic Railway was the beach's first thrill ride and was located at the present site of the Giant Dipper. And Nancy knows everything there is to know about the Giant Dipper. The Giant Dipper was built in, in 1924 under the direction of Arthur Loof, the son of Charles Loof, the manufacturer of the famous merry-go-round installed at the boardwalk in 1911. In 1987, both the Giant Dipper and the Antique Carousel were designated as National Historic Landmarks by the National Park Service. Giant Dipper trivia includes the number 13,729 as the most riders in a single day, June 1987. 
862 gallons of paint to give the structure its necessary two coats. <coughs> and, and the most unusual item lost by the giant by a giant dipper rider. Can you guess? A glass eye. And <laughs> Herb Kane's quote, oh, you can't see it. No, oh, bummer. There it is. It was a fine two buck, two minute ride, a tooth loosener, eyeball popper, and one long shriek from Herd Kane from the San Francisco Chronicle. And it certainly was an eyeball popper. This image was borrowed from the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk website. From 1911 to 2007, each original horse traveled a distance equivalent to circling the globe 12 times. The Wurlitzer organ originally resided at the San Francisco Plainland at the beach from 1918 until its closure in 1972. The website mentions it is only one of a handful Mary Grounds in existence with the ring machine, and that for every 6.5 persons who ride the Mary Grounds today, one person walks off with a ring. That amounts to 70,000 replacement rings that must be purchased every year. In the 1970s, the rings were briefly discontinued, but only briefly, as the ridership plummeted by 75%. So I guess if you couldn't grab the ring and throw it at the clown's mouth, you weren't going to ride. Hmm. Okay. One of the thrill rides, the Sky Glider installed in 1967, 1,000 foot uh, distance, beautiful views of the bay and the beach. This was the vacation destination in 1950s for the, you know, for many people. And uh, Beach Street, which is the street that you're looking at there, often <laughs> still looks like that today on sunny weekends. Um, and with the locals and the tourists heading for the uh, boardwalk, quote, warm sand, cool surf, hot rides. In 1974, oh, th this is the 1951 Miss America pageant with a record 36,000 attendants. So this was a definitely a popular place. In 1974, a glorious 4th of July fireworks extravaganza was canceled due to fog rolling in at 200 feet when 1,500 foot clearance was needed. The huge crowd of 50,000 people was disappointed and then became belligerent. Then at 10 p.m., a power failure occurred, plunging the boardwalk into darkness. The automatic... Um, you know, emer the emergency lighting system came on, but it, it everybody had to leave. And the mass exodus of frustrated spectators created a massive traffic gridlock. I actually remember that day. I was there, not there, but there. Um, it became clear to the organizers that the show could no longer be safely accommodated and all future fireworks shows were canceled. So a wealth of casino arcade machine and beach concessions, unique foods, thrill rides, games of skill and chance, coconut grove events, and beach bandstand concerts are still going on today, delighting locals and tourists alike. And Christmas is coming. What will the featured location be on this year's card? Oh, I forgot apostrophe S. So that's it. I'm going to stop my share. That was a lot. I know it was a long time. No, that was fantastic. Thank you, man. Enjoyed uh, every word of it. Oh, good. Great I'm job. Glad you liked it. Great job.